Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm super thrilled to be here. And today I'm going to chat about how we see the world of AI engineering changing and what we've learned from hundreds of uh, development cycles and deployments um, on real world problems in the field. Hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll get a sense of how we think about data science and machine learning and how we can make it a little bit less of an art form and more of an engineering practice. First, a little bit about myself. Uh, I started working on Snorkel you know, almost five years ago, back when we were still a, an academic project uh, and an open source project back at the Stanford AI Lab. Um, and since then, I've had the opportunity to build and deploy a number of these systems with some of the world's leading and, and most advanced organizations. Um, and today, I'm hoping to share some of those principles with you all. So by the end of this talk, one of the key takeaways that I'd, I'd love to impart is this idea that debuggability and introspection is a critical part of AI engineering. Somehow, it seems like we've lost touch of some of these core engineering principles with you know, the excitement of modern architectures and techniques, um, but I'm really hoping to recenter on these core tenets by the end of uh, my, my uh, discussion with you all today. And of course, if I'm successful, I'll hope that you'll see how these core pieces around debuggability and iteration are enabled by a shift from a model-centric to data-centric view of AI engineering and development overall. So let's chart the course for today. Uh, we'll start by talking about some of the modern bottlenecks and challenges that we see in AI engineering. Then we'll talk a little bit about how uh, data-centric principles can be applied to mitigate these challenges in practice. And finally, we'll actually talk through a case study to give you all a sense of what it feels and looks like to apply these sorts of principles in, in practice. So let's start with some of the challenges of modern AI engineering. What we found working with customers and users is that a lot more time is being spent on the data than the models. Right? When you actually look at the numbers, this isn't wholly surprising. Most of the iceberg under the surface of data is unstructured and unlabeled. It's, it's not quite ready for AI uh, use. You know, we're talking about really valuable information that shows up in contracts, buried within patient files, um, hidden in, in chat conversations, right? And all of this data, which is technically really rich with information to train automation in AI systems, um, isn't actually possible to be used until it's curated and labeled. Right? That process of curation and labeling and processing often involves much more traditional manual labeling approaches and pre-processing approaches, which can add up and lead to weeks or months or even longer of, of manual effort. To add to that challenge, what we're seeing is that training data development isn't a one-time cost either. It's a heavily iterative process. Now, let's take an example. Let's, let's Assume that we're trying to build a binary spam classification um, model over your emails. Right? To start, you might realize and you might work with some experts within your IT or security department to realize, um, hey, this is how we actually want to define spam versus ham or, or not spam. Over time, you might realize that there's actually a new class that you care a lot about. You know, phishing, for example, is a type of spam that you actually want to break out of your classifier and add to your model in order to enforce some, some level of additional safety uh, for your organization. Later, you might then find an edge case, right, where maybe you have that one coworker who's always sending non-relevant messages or memes or, you know, all, all sorts of messages, and uh, you need to clarify what the definition of spam or not spam actually means in those settings. In general, what we're learning from these settings is that it takes a number of iterations and cycles to actually define a label schema, calibrate annotators, uh, clarify edge cases, you know, then train models and, and have some outputs before repeating this process over and over again. Right? We actually need new tools and workflows and interfaces to think about relabeling and recurating your training data as a result of these either data distribution changes or business logic and label schema changes. Once you've shipped a model, right, the challenge doesn't stop there. Ongoing change is inevitable, and you might find that in production, there are different distributions of data that you see that you didn't even expect when you first developed your model. Right? There might be further changes to business requirements or objectives, and overall, right, it all comes back to the data. Right? Rather than 
having to manually relabel and start from scratch every single time you see one of these changes uh, to either the inputs or outputs of your system, um, you would need to relabel and spend all that manual effort in order to, to build to the high, high levels of quality that you need for impact. Beyond iteration for a single model, we're also seeing that to get to production, we need applications that cover more than just a model. What we're seeing is that AI applications actually require a whole range of what we call data operations to get to production. This might include cleaning and integration operations upstream to pull in a variety of data sources and make them ready for AI engineering use. It might include post-processing and business logic, right, to get your predictions in the right format so that you can actually uh, ship and, and uh, get these outputs into the right downstream applications, products, and, and dashboards for, for later consumption. And so this general trend that, you know, it goes beyond simply this deep learning model isn't one that we've identified in a vacuum. Right, this is a trend we're seeing more broadly. Last year, Sumith uh, Chintala, the creator of PyTorch, made a very similar observation on, on Twitter. Right? He stated that deep learning on its own is not the singular solution to real-world automation. And so what I love all of us here today to think a little bit more about is what are the consequences of this shift? Right? What, what happens when we're thinking about building these impactful AI applications and we need to think beyond the models? What we're really seeing is that AI engineering is fundamentally shifting from a model-centric to a data-centric approach. We'll need new ways to efficiently debug and iterate and uh, introspect on our training data sets at each stage of our pipeline. We'll need new ways to perform data operations, right, to clean and integrate and post-process the, the predictions of those models in order to get to production. And so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to share a few of these principles and uh, signposts that we keep in mind in order to apply um, certain new practices to make AI engineering a little bit more practical right at the end of the day. So these are the four guiding principles that we found have been especially helpful to formulating and iterating on AI applications. Now I'll note as a, as a little bit of a caveat to say while these are helpful to keep in mind, they're by no means hard and fast rules, right? They're intended to serve as reminders and guideposts to helping you all make better design decisions when building AI applications from scratch. So let's get started. Our first, our, our first principle is down with the end-to-end -end mega model. Just like all of you, I'm sure you're on Twitter and we've all seen these really impressive monolithic zero-shot model demos. In fact, we at Snorkel are really, really excited and are actively contributing to the literature around how these approaches can fit in and, and work really well within this data-centric approach. In practical settings, what we tend to see and encourage is that these sorts of models on their own are really challenging to use in a vacuum, right? And the key challenge that we're seeing over and over again is around debuggability and introspection. So what do I mean by that? The key to getting pr to production isn't just getting lucky, right? To, to say, hey, there's a model that's already pre-trained that I can download and can do my task perfectly, right? A lot of the times we need to diagnose and correct and fine tune these models to fit our specific tasks, our specific data settings. And it's really hard to understand where the mistakes are coming from, right? What should I be doing next when we're treating these models as black boxes, right? Instead, we should be taking these models and trying to understand, understand fine-grained performance, to do error analysis, and to you know, figure out how we can actually take actionable steps to improve fine-grained performance. And so our recommendation in a lot of these settings is you know, a, a practice that's fairly understood and, and recommended in traditional software engineering around decomposition. Right, the idea here is to break down your ML pipeline, your end-to-end -end models into relevant subcomponents or tasks so that you can actually understand and audit quality at each, sta at each stage in the pipeline. Right, when building your systems and building the infrastructure around your model, model building and AI systems, it's really important to have the right interfaces in mind. Right? It's really important to be able to log and introspect data at different components. It's really important to be able to perform error analysis and score different parts of your pipeline. It's important to be able to version control and iterate at, at, at each point in the pipeline as well, so that down the line you can actually introspect and understand where should I be spending more time, where is the root cause of my end-to-end -end 
you know, issues, uh, uh, you know, when, when I want to actually ship this to production. And so this translates fairly well to our next principle here around end-to-end um, -end evaluation and iteration. So with decomposition, we're seeing that we get the advantages of, you know, introspection, where now improving your AI model is actually about making more efficient targeted fixes to your pipelines. Right, this could either involve adding targeted slices of training data, um, improving you know, your label quality in different parts of your pipeline, or adding the necessary, again, data operators to fine tune or correct mistakes, right, or, or post-process predictions so that they're in the right format for the end model, to, uh, the, the end application to consume. Um, the recommendation here, again, is to architect your system in a way so you can peek at data at different parts, evaluate piecewise components, and output and understand how to prioritize against different quality metrics at different stages in your pipeline. Again, there's been a trend recently around how simply adding more data um, can help us get to higher quality. And while we agree with that in general, I think the key principle here is we want to add targeted data, right? We want to really be able to uh, perform specific error analysis to understand where in your pipeline needs additional attention because all of, all of our time right, in this room is so valuable right, as, as practitioners and, and AI engineers. So now that we have a little bit of a high-level framework in place for how to think about this system and decomposition in general, let's talk more about how we actually end up building these individual components, right? these, these building blocks. So this next principle is about how ML, machine learning, should not be the universal defaults when we're building an AI application. Now this might seem counterintuitive to start with, but, but bear with me, right? And I like to think about this in terms of um, a, a higher level abstraction, right? Each building block or component in your pipeline, we can really think about in a lot of ways as a, as a data frame transformation. For example, right here, let's go back to our uh, spam classification example. When we think about it, we can think of our classifier as a data operator that simply adds a prediction column you know, to our data frames, indicating whether or not we think that particular uh, email is spam or not. Now, that says nothing about the actual implementation details of that um, specific operator or, or uh, building block. Right, this classifier could actually be implemented as a heuristic. It could be something as simple as, you know, if the words free money show up in the, in the subject of my email, then yeah, it's, it's, it's probably spam, right? Um, this is a very simple example, but hopefully drives home this idea that we can start with this much more heuristic, much simpler, off-the-shelf sort of approach. Now, if we're finding based on error analysis or mistakes that the model's making, generalization errors that we need to address that we do need machine learning, great. We can swap in a learned classifier, right? In this case, we might take a, uh, a hugging face model and fine tune it on our data and try to understand how these uh, deeper representations of a deep learning model will, will, will help us make a prediction as to whether or not, again, this input data frame representing emails is, is spam or not. Again, the point here is to start simple, right? It's to say, let's take an approach that will, will get us uh, pretty far, right? Use, use heuristics to um, solve, solve the problem where we can, and then layer on complexity where necessary, right? We want to use empirical methods and analyses to actually understand when we want to prioritize making much more advanced trade-offs in our systems. Finally, in this last principle, I want to talk a little bit more about how programmatic labeling can be really critical to iterating on models in your pipeline as quickly as possible in, in, in these end-to-end uh, uh, -end efforts. So traditionally, when you're building models right within these end-to-end -end pipelines, most folks are, are stuck in this phase of uh, uh, manual labeling. Right? That, that's often a very big bottleneck to, to iteration and kind of building out these um, uh, models uh, in, in practice. And traditionally, there are two primary approaches that we see Right, uh, different organizations use to label their data. One of them is, you know, you might try to outsource um, your your uh, labeling processes, and another might be, you know, building an in-house team of experts, right, to kind of manually label or, or or some combination of these sorts of manual labeling approaches. And what we found is that these approaches are often really challenging when you need to iterate quickly, right? I'll pull out a few examples. It's it can be quite slow, you know, that's that's the obvious one when you're manually labeling data one by one in production settings um, where you need to create an, uh, you know, uh, kind of recruit an army of hand labelers to, again, go through tens of thousands or potentially millions of documents to label. 
um, that process in itself also isn't particularly auditable, right? It, it can be actually challenging to understand why certain decisions were made, you know, why, why certain trade-offs were made, what, what definitions or annotation schemas were actually used, right, to, to uh, assign labels to your training data. And of course, in the adaptation setting, right, when you actually need to change your label schema or make updates um, based on, you know, certain distribution changes, you have to start over, right? You have to go from scratch and kind of restart this process of labeling by hand. So this process in itself can be a really challenging bottleneck when it comes to trying to build these systems in much more efficient ways. At Snorkel, we lean on what we call labeling functions to enable a programmatic labeling workflow um, to, to overcome this bottleneck of manual labeled data, right? It's a simple but powerful idea, and that's that Instead of manually labeling your data, you're actually labeling your data programmatically, right? You're using functions and code and much more efficient methods to label rather than specifying ground truth one by one, one at a time. These labeling functions can come in a number of different formats, right? They could be as simple as ex using exactly that heuristic, you know, that we built our system with in the first place. It could be something as simple as, hey, if the words, keywords, free money, show up in my email, great, then label it spam. And they can also capture much more advanced patterns, right? You can imagine, say, using an ontology that's curated internally or that's scraped from the web, you know, to inject this, this domain expertise directly, right? You can imagine actually wrapping a much more advanced model, right? Say a, a zero-shot model or, or something, you know, a foundation model that's making its rounds, you know, on the internet. You can actually try that, right, and kind of wrap that to specify labels um, in your system. The key here is that these sources of supervision can be noisy, right? They, they, can, uh, they, they don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be perfectly precise. And, you know, Snorkel is able to take those labeling functions, integrate and denoise them into training data sets. And, you know, later you can use those training data sets to build ML models that generalize more broadly, right? This general technique around weak supervision and programmatic labeling is built on years of research at the Stanford AI Lab and, and other you know, great universities. And I encourage you to kind of take a look at the, the literature that we have out there and um, some, some of the resources on, your web, on our website if, if you um, have additional you know, questions or, or, or uh, curiosities here. But at its core, the main idea to take away from this core technology around programmatic labeling is you can build large, high quality training data sets really quickly, right? Much more quickly than you would with a manual labeling approach. And critically, you can adapt and iterate, right, with these sorts of functions, right? Rather than thinking about your training data set as a one-time process that's fragmented, right, that you have to send, you know, dozens of Slack messages to curate a new one, now the training data is a part of your development loop. You're literally programming your training data, and when you need to make changes based on model errors or, again, schema changes, you can simply refactor your code. Right, you can add a new if statement or break a, break a labeling function into multiple. And um, that's the kind of really powerful idea here is that when you start treating your training data set as something you can program, um, AI engineering becomes a fundamentally more practical and efficient part of your workflow. Great. So that's the crux of our approach, right? With these four principles, um, we're able to think a lot more about decomposition, about de debuggability of our pipelines. We're able to start a lot simpler, right, and iterate from there um, based on very concrete, empirically driven mistakes or, or bottlenecks in our pipelines. Now, I'm going to take these principles and apply them to um, a, a use case that's model after one that we, we've actually seen as, as really, really valuable in production settings. And this is around social media monitoring, right? So the idea here is um, we want to understand how different company, different public company stocks are being perceived on social media. Um, you know, we want to understand the sentiment of these companies so that we can make, uh, uh, you know, different risk analysis or investment decisions. Now, I won't speak to anyone's personal habits, but as you all know, this was a very important uh, real-world application given recent events in, in the last year. But all joking aside, right, to, to put this more formally, the goal here is to allow us to understand, hey, given as input a set of tweets, you know, which, which we'll treat as documents in this case, more, more generally. Um, we want to pull out the companies that are mentioned and the associated sentiments, so key value pairs of company stock ticker with an associated positive or negative sentiment. And so, you know, like any great ML engineer, I'll, I'll you know, go to Twitter, you know, do, do my daily uh, archive passes and try to figure out what fancy architectures are out there for me to use. And 
you know, I might download this architecture, you know, train my model, um, and make an initial set of predictions to find that, hey, when I come to evaluate this, unfortunately, it's not quite ready for deployment, right? Maybe the, maybe the quality or F1 score is a little bit too low. I'll take this model and, and my, my questions and concerns to uh, MLE, machine learning engineering stand-up, right, where I'll talk to my team and solicit a number of uh, opinions, right? Uh, a lot of these issues are about where, you know, uh, the model's making mistakes, right? Are we actually generalizing to new companies? What's, what's the issue there, right? Are, are we actually doing the sentiment classification problem correctly? And overall, with this black box approach, it ends up being much harder to understand fine-grained performance and to do our analysis, right, and to understand data quality and understand critically where I should be spending my time, right? Besides just throwing more and more volumes of data at the system, I'd rather have a much more targeted approach, whether it's writing, you know, software 1.0 code, right, to kind of make corrections or, or improve my logging or um, adding very curated slices of data to target the mistakes that the system is making. And so, Again, the, the mental model that we have here is to decompose, right? Rather than starting with an opaque end-to-end -end model, let's consider what it might look like to actually formulate this problem as a set of conceptual um, tasks or subcomponents and then iterate from there. So I'll now briefly walk through each one of these components to give you a sense what it looks like. But at a high level, right, we have a, an entity tagger that is intended to pull out companies from this set of tweets, a classifier for sentiment uh, for each one of those companies, a linker which assigns each one of those company mentions to a specific stock ticker symbol. And finally, a, a more um, post-processing operator called the reducer to identify a single prediction per stock ticker ra rather than one per mention in the article because different companies can be mentioned multiple times in, in each one of these tweets. And the output, again, is, is the same as earlier. We want to have key value pairs between stock ticker symbols and sentiments. Okay, so let's jump in. The company tagger, specifically, you can think of as a named entity tagger. Um, this has the job of, again, taking tweets as input, so uh, just raw text, and outputting company mentioned spans. So when we say span, we mean literally character start, character end, as to where in the document these companies are showing up. And you know, let's say I take this approach right to stand up again, and my teammate says, hey, actually, last quarter I worked on a project where you know, I, I already scraped a list of Fortune 500 companies. Do you think that'll be helpful? And in the spirit of simplicity, and you know, not assuming that machine learning has to be used as a default, um, I think it's a very reasonable first step to say, yeah, let's just use this and see if it solves our end problem. Um, so one thing we can do here is to first implement this entity tagger as a dictionary-based approach. Right, a very practical way to, again, pull out company names is by literally trying to match on keywords of a scraped dictionary that we already have on hand. Um, great. As a next step, we want to actually classify the sentiment of each one of these company mentions in context. So what would I do here? Right? A, a really straightforward approach, again, might be to use some off-the-shelf models to get me started. Right? Nothing t super fancy or, or you know, bespoke to my specific problem. Let's just do what's most efficient and say, you know, import a model from NLTK or the Vader library, right, and, um, you know, concatenate my, my span plus surrounding tokens and, and use that as a classifier, right, and, and use that as a way to um, understand, hey, for each one of these mentions, is it being mentioned in a context of, of positive or, or negative words, right? That's really what we're trying to get out here. Again, super simple approach. We're just pulling some off-the-shelf models, um, and, you know, we're able to get this done pretty efficiently. As a next step, we then want to link each one of the company mentions that we pulled out to a canonical stock ticker symbol, right? Again, you know, in the spirit of simplicity, let's lean on heuristics and fuzzy matching, right, to map each one of these steps, um, each, each one of these company mentions to a canonical symbol, right? This, this can help us, you know, understand if there are, you know, different versions of the same word and try to map them down to a um, stock ticker to, to deduplicate, right, at the end of our pipeline. And finally, right, the, the original goal of this problem was, of course, to get key value pairs of company stock tickers and sentiments, right? And right now what we have are predictions for every single one of our um, company mentions, right, which, which is different. There could be multiple mentions of a company within a tweet, but what we really want is just a single post-processed prediction for that company overall. So what we can do here is to simply post-process this using a majority vote reducer, you know, data operator, to say, 
hey, what's the most common prediction for each one of my company mentions? And let's assign that to the entity, right? Let's assign that to the stock ticker symbol um, based on what we assigned earlier in the pipeline. So we have our pipeline. We have an initial pass at um, what each step might look like. And again, if we have the right tooling in place, we'll be able to actually introspect and understand what quality looks like at each one of these steps. So in this case, we might say, hey, we evaluated end to end, still not quite there. And we have an obvious hotspot, right, for where we need to focus attention. This is in the, the named entity tagger step. So that's a pretty clear sign that that's where we can cement a little bit more of our attention, right? Based on some error analysis, looking at examples, we might see that, hey, we're not generalizing to new, new companies, right, um, that weren't covered in our dictionary. Super reasonable. And so as a next step, we might go in and swap out that dictionary-based named entity tagger for a, for a learned classifier, right? In this case, we might take some pre-trained models, again, architectures, and we still have the bottleneck, though, of kind of creating curated training data based on our specific problem. And this is where programmatic labeling and labeling functions can come in. So in this case, we might want to iterate on this sequence tagging model, right? So this is a deep learning model that has a goal of making token level predictions about whether something is a company that we care about or not. And we can use a number of different labeling function templates to uh, supervise our problem, right? We could say things like, hey, heuristically, let me write a regex that you know, matches on any sort of capital, you know, capitalized word, right, that comes right before incorporated or, or co, you know, any, any sort of suffix that might indicate a company. Um, in addition, let me actually take that dictionary that my teammate scraped, it's, it's, you know, it's still really useful, and let me try to use that and wrap that into a labeling function, right? Let me just take that and use that as another source of potentially noisy but still valuable supervision for my system. And finally, right, why not try something a little bit fancier, right? Let's, let's take one of these foundation models or zero-shot models um, that, that's on the web and try to prompt it with something like, what are the companies that are named here, right? And uh, see if that gives us a little bit more gener uh, generalization. Again, none of these approaches have to be perfect, but with Snorkel, you're able to dump the signal in, get initial versions of your training data sets, train models, and iterate from there really, really rapidly. And so with this process, we're able to build the training data set, train a model, and you know, hopefully by the end of this process, improve our pipeline right, and see our end-to-end -end application scores improve. So not just the local scores that we saw for that entity tagger operator, but also end-to-end, -end, right? We, we might see that, hey, this is in a much better spot right, for us to go into production with. So what have we seen here? Right? We've seen how a lot of these principles, which, which we're calling as a little bit more data-centric, um, can help us with debugging and iterating on our AI pipelines, right? And when we, when we think about these at the end of the day, they're not entirely new, right? I'll note that some folks in the room might notice that they really remind us of other practices from software engineering, right? Prioritizing modularity and the single responsibility principle, right, is, is not a new idea. Um, making sure that we have the right tools to debug and iterate and introspect, again, a, a really important part of any, any software engineer's uh, uh, tooling. The ability to start simple and avoid premature optimization, right? Um, it, it's, it's a really important thing to make sure that we're making trade-offs and, and decisions to bias towards simplicity when we're starting. And you know, machine learning, by its nature, is a very complex you know, a, a set, of, set of code to introduce into a pipeline if, hey, maybe at the end of the day, you don't really need it. And so, and finally, right, building with change in mind, right, prioritizing iteration, prioritizing workflows and methods and techniques that allow you to actually really quickly change and update and, and curate your modeling process, right, end up being really, really important. And so, with these prin principles in mind, I hope that, you know, we can take these um, and, and apply them to future AI engineering projects. And, you know, hopefully, uh, we'll, we'll be able to see how these specific principles can help us get to production faster um, and make life a little bit easier, right, for all the AI practitioners in the room. So thank you, everyone. I really value the, the time you shared with me today, and uh, I'm excited to continue learning from you all and building on this set of uh, best practices for AI and AI engineering in general. Thanks so much. All right. Looks like I have a few minutes for questions, so I'm more than happy to take a few. Um, I see, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>
That's a great question. So the question is, can we write labeling functions for medical imaging classification as well? Short answer is yes. Um, actually, some of my initial research was, was working alongside doctors at the Stanford Medical School to, you know, I called it a graduate student in the loop AI development, right? We would <laughs> work with them and write labeling functions and try to express heuristics over medical images um, that the doctors had in their mind. So we would say things like, hey, can you, uh, you know, if this blob in the image is particularly high contrast, right, that's abnormal, that's, that's weird, that's, that's a sign that something is wrong. And so that process was something that we went through to, um, you know, build that out for different modalities. So this is a very general purpose workflow and, and technique for all sorts of data modalities or techniques. Yeah. Uh, I have a question here. Yeah, is, is the question, um, do we support using ontologies during entity tagging? Short, short answer there is yes, again, right? I think it's actually a very powerful technique for a problem like entity tagging to say, hey, let me just use, you know, let's take the medical domain again, right? Like that one is really, really, um, like, uh, you know, important here, right? Because in the medical domain, the subject matter experts who are gonna be labeling are doctors, right? They're, they're kind of medical practitioners who, um, ha, you know, there, one, there aren't many, many of them out there and, and their time is super valuable. And so taking advantage of as many existing resources as possible is really important. And in medicine, right, we might see that um, there are a bunch of ontologies that already exist, right? SNOMED and, and other sorts of uh, medical resources um, can be used and kind of you know, wrapped in a labeling function to say, hey, anything that shows up in this ontology, label this way. Anything that shows up in this sub-hierarchy, right, label the other way, um, you know, can apply to, to internal knowledge bases or ontologies as well. You know, we've worked with financial institutions to, to build that out. And so, yeah, it, it's actually a very popular and important source of supervision that you can imagine wrapping into your system. And again, the critical point is it doesn't have to be perfect, right, as the first pass. You can wrap it into your system and, and take advantage of it to bootstrap your labeling process. Awesome. I have a question there, I think, that I saw earlier. Um, what's the most complex that you Good question. Off the top of my head, okay. The most complex programmatic labeling that I have done um, is a good question. I think one of, one of my favorite aha moments with, with programmatic labeling is something we tend to call you know, cross-modal supervision, right? Or, or the idea that you can actually use resources that you would never even consider using within your ML pipeline to supervise your model. So this might be, hey, I have um, you know, a set of, uh, again, medical images and text reports right, associated with them that are really noisy. Um, and during inference time, obviously the text reports aren't gonna be available, right, because the doctor hasn't looked at them. But you can actually use that um, you know, exhaust or kind of metadata or separate information as supervision for your system. So you could write labeling functions over those text reports and um, really create create labels out of, you know, artifacts or metadata or other systems that really, you know, we, we never really would have thought as, as kind of viable features in the machine learning pipeline. So this general idea that you can take metadata, you know, from all sorts of complex and crazy situations and push them into your pipeline. You can take future time steps, right, uh, uh, you know, stuff that the system has never seen before and use that to generate labels. Um, it's a really powerful abstraction where, hey, now, you know, when you're thinking about pipelining for these systems, um, you get a lot more flexibility um, in terms of how you, how you source your labels. It's a fun question, thanks. All right, I think I have time for one more question. All right, we got one here. Right. Yeah. So how do you also not leak that you know heuristic or that understanding the bias Right. That that's a really really good question. Let me pop back to a slide if I am able to. Um, so the, the way I think about that is, you know, so, sorry, the, the question was about how do we avoid bias in our, in our systems because the labeling functions are actually capturing, right, um, a, a set of heuristics or biases from, from you know, humans um, and avoid that from leaking into our uh, end models. 
right? So the way I think about this is, you know, labeling functions cover some subsets of the data space, right? They're intended to kind of inject a little bit of human intuition into the system, but, you know, they don't have to be perfect, right? You're not actually using it as a rules-based system, and that's the difference here, right? With a rules-based system, that's actually governing how exactly your system's gonna make decisions. So bias there is actually really, really dangerous, right? The difference with labeling functions is that they can be noisy, right? They, they can be, you know, uh, something that you correct and iterate on later because at the end of the day, what you're really trying to do is learn a model that, you know, what the model's doing in this diagram is learning a decision boundary, right? Whereas the labeling functions are, you know, labeling subsets of the data in your, your kind of data or feature space. And so the model has the job of generalizing beyond the scope of labeling functions. So often what we see is that if you use the right model at the end of the day, powered by you know, a bootstrap set of labeling functions, you can actually generalize and maybe even correct right, some of the biases that were in your labeling functions because you're learning right, uh, uh, how, how these interact and, and how they can be denoised right, in a richer kind of feature space. Another really important thing um, that we, we recommend that's a little bit more boring is you know, iteration is just critical. Right? Like this, this loop down here, using a set of error analysis tools, just looking at where, where mistakes are being made, you know, putting on the, you know, the, the elbow grease techniques to, to just try and improve your data quality ends up helping with the bias problem a lot too. Because one, now you actually know the rationale for humans, right? Like why someone labeled one thing versus another. So in many ways, this ends up being a much more auditable type of system. And two, right, if you build in analysis loops and error analysis and these data-centric workflows into your workflow, you're able to catch those a little bit more ahead of time, right? Whereas otherwise, it's kind of a black box and you, you kind of just get guessing. So. You know, second answer is the more practical one, but maybe a little more boring, which is, yeah, just look at your data and you know, update your, your code or labeling functions. And if you have the right workflow to do that, um, we found that we're able to actually connect, uh, correct these types of issues in production much more readily. Yeah, thanks for your question. All right, thank you folks.